thing I like to always highlight here is that I, I, I really, really like to join different disciplines together. You know? So I have electronics, physics, chemistry, and now I'm currently looking for a biologist because we are, we are about to start some experiments with biological processes. And this is what my group does. It's looking for applications, looking for technologies, combining different disciplines. So if you are interested in, in some, something that we do, I will be very happy to tell you a lot of uh, the details on the, on the projects that we do, and I don't know what's happening. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. <laughs> uh, what's going on? Is this? No, but this thing is... Okay. Yeah. Now it's... Yeah. Okay. It's a classical problem. <laughs> 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 so this is this is more or less uh, the work that we do. It can be divided in these four four big uh, sections. One of them, as I told you, is a spectroscopy using non-classical light. So here, what we try to do is to exploit quantum correlation between pairs of photons in order to get information about a bio biological sample of a chemical sample. This is one part. Another part uh, that we work on is photochemical dynamics under incohering illumination. So basically here, we are trying to, to find new ways of producing organic materials for organic photovoltaics. So that is how can we structure new materials in order to get the best efficiency that we can, that we can get. Right. Another part which is uh, more or less new, when we started last, last year, 2018, which is a combination of multi-photon quantum state engineering and quantum PT symmetry uh, phenomena, which work with BLAST on this topic. And basically here is how can we uh, design new technologies um, exploiting the correlation between multiple photons. So here what we do is we design new sources for uh, entangled uh, multi-photon states and also design new uh, photonic devices. So basically it's sensors. So we are interested in quantum sensing in this, in this part. And finally something that, that we are just starting, we started this, this year, is something that is called deep learning based for resolution imaging. So it's basically using machine learning for developing a uh, super resolution. So it's trying to somehow, uh, instead of using shorter wavelengths, use a neural network to get better resolution with optical wavelengths. So that's more or less what we do in this, in this part. But today, I will talk about this uh, spectroscopy with non-classical light. And in order to understand how this, this works, let me start by uh, explaining a little bit of what is the classical, in the sense, standard optical spectroscopy. So typically, when we talk about spectroscopy, we are interested in looking at the frequencies that a sample likes to absorb, likes to eat. So what we do is we monitor different frequencies, different colors, and then look at the response of the sample to those colors. So this is a typical uh, image that we get. Now some, some uh, absorption spectrum, which is called. And we look at the, these kind of signals, and we see that there are some frequencies that the sample likes to eat, and that's fine. And we know now how this interacts with light. But that's it. We don't know anything else. But if we are interested in, in knowing how these uh, transitions interact and how they behave uh, with each other, we need to go another dimension more, which is uh, called <laughs> the optical spectroscopy. And in this type of spectroscopy, what we do is we use light with different frequencies, but also we resolve the light that we are detecting. So we are looking at different colors in the emission of the light that is being absorbed by the sample and the light that is coming out from the sample. So we resolve those two colors. And what we can get from this uh, type of maps is, for instance, if we excite the sample with some frequency E1, and the sample uh, sends light something around that E1, that means that we excited one transition, and then there was some relaxation process, and it, it, it emitted the light. Nothing happened. But now what happens if we look at the other uh, signal? So here, what we are saying is that we are sending light with E1 to the sample, and then the sample is sending us light at the frequency E2. So that means that at some point, we send light it, it uh, promoted this transition, and then this energy packet, let's, let's call it, it, was, it moved to the next transition. There was some coupling between those two electronic transitions. That's the only way we can get energy from this, 
this transition here. So that means that these cross peaks that we get in this two-dimensional spectrum is telling us something about the electronic transitions. So it's telling us that those transitions are coupled. And we can extract information about that coupling, which is uh, shown here as a J, by looking at this type of maps. So this is, this is important. We can get information about the, how the electronic structure of a sample is done and the interaction between those. Uh, and, and one of the key ingredients is that we need light, which is really, really broad. So we need really broad spectrum. We can either use a lamp, which is broad, and then select different colors, or we can buy, if we have enough money, a laser, which is tunable in a very uh, <laughs> big range, right? So that's, that's one part. So we can probe uh, the structure of the samples, but also we can probe the dynamics of those uh, excitations within the samples. And to do that, it's like taking pictures very fast and how this energy is moving in the molecules or the complex that we are uh, studying. And to do that, we need a very fast flash for the, for the camera, right? So that means that we need to use ultra fast uh, pulses, ultra short pulses, sorry. Um, these short pulses should be in the order of the dynamics of the molecule, which will be something like picosecond, femtosecond, time duration, so those are really, really short pulses. So in order to do that, we need to get a source that produces this type of, of pulses, and also we need to somehow control the delay between those. Of course, the combination of all these things makes the, the setup quite uh, expensive, and what I want to show today is that quantum light can help making this a bit cheaper. So how, how this uh, the idea of non-classical light works? Well, let's see at the typical scheme. So here we use a continuous wave pump. This is something we don't need femtoseconds anymore. And it is because this nonlinear crystal, uh, but through a process which is called a spontaneous parametric down conversion, one of the pump photons it, uh, is down converted into a pair of photons here. Interestingly, these photons behave as uh, short pulses. So they can be as short as hundreds of femtoseconds, and, and, and we have really, really fast uh, pulses here. So you see here that uh, what we are saying is that we can use a continuous wave pumping for probing ultra-fast dynamics, because those, those photons behave as, as short pulses. More interesting things about this scheme is that we can produce degenerate or non-degenerated photon wave packets, and we do that by controlling the phase matching condition in the nonlinear crystal, which can be done by uh, changing the temperature of the crystal, for instance. Another uh, uh, parameter that we can control is the correlation time. I will explain what is this correlation or entanglement time between photons. And to do that, we just uh, need to change the length of that, of that crystal. And also, we can introduce always external delays within the, the correlation window. So we, you, you see here that we have a lot of knobs that we can play with to, to get some, something, uh, some information about the sample that is uh, absorbing those, those photons. So uh, more interesting properties. Uh, something that is uh, quite uh, important to, to say here is that a lot of people is interested in actually doing this experimentally. This is having done experimentally. And it's because there are two big, big problems to do that, which we solved this year. So now we are doing it experimentally, and hopefully by, I don't know if by the end of the year, but probably by the, by the beginning of next year, we will have now the experiment done. So that will be the first time that this experiment is, is done. And you see that a lot of people uh, who is quite famous in, within this community, Sean Camel from the University of California, Irvine. He says, it's an important learning tool for studying photosynthetic complexes. Uh, Andres Stefano from, from the University of Bern, he also said something that I expect entangled photon spectroscopy to be a groundbreaking new way of performing optical spectroscopy. This is 2018, so it's quite recent. And also Michael Reimer, who is uh, he's leading uh, right now the, 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 the US Quantum National Initiative. Um, who is, uh, this act was uh, already signed in December, 21st December, and it's uh, about giving $1.2 billion for five years in the US for developing quantum technology. So this guy is quite, quite important right now. He's pushing all of this effort. And he also says that two photon entangled states have the potential to provide simultaneous time and frequency information beyond the 
the classical uncertainty limits. I will tell you why in a moment. And it will provide enhanced microscopic resolution. But of course, everything looks very nice. But there are two problems uh, with this technique, as it was suggested uh, at the beginning. One is that it requires multiple nonlinear optics. That means it requires a lot of nonlinear crystals. That's a really, really big technical problem and also economical problem because we need to buy hundreds of nonlinear crystals and it's quite, quite expensive. And the other one is that in the original proposal of this technique by Saleh uh, in 1998, is that a priori knowledge of something about the, the sample is needed. So that is really not uh, appealing, right? It's like, well, I want to create a new technique that won't allow me to probe arbitrary media or non-media. So, so that, that is not really interesting. But now, if we can solve these two problems, then it becomes interesting. So let me tell you how this can be, can be solved. And to know that or to understand that, uh, let me tell you a little bit on how this entangled photon absorption uh, works. So you see here that we have a pump beam which is continuous. We have this nonlinear crystal that will produce this pair of photons. These pair of photons uh, are produced in this SPDC process. It's called type two. Type two means that these two photons, one of them has, well, both, uh, they, they, they have uh, orthogonal polarization. So one of them is horizontal, the other one is vertical. So this, this crystal is by refringent. So what happens is that the speed at which they travel within the crystal is different. So when they come out of the crystal, there is some time delay between the, the photons. This time delay is what we call entanglement time or correlation time. And why it's called correlation time? Because if we have two detectors and we want to detect those two together, or it's called detect uh, in coincidence, that means that within that time window, we will see the two photons that were produced by the pump photon. So that's why we call it correlation time. So we can control that by changing the length of the crystal. This will become very important, so please remember this definition of entanglement time correlation time. So after that, we can introduce some delay between those photons. That's, that's OK. Um, and then uh, we focus those two photons into the sample. And what we typically get, or the, the, the signals that are typically observed, is something like that. Look at this uh, behavior. You see that at some uh, values of the photon flux, the, the photons that are being sent to the sample, there is some linear behavior and then it turns quadratic. This is important because typical uh, experiments with two photon absorption, we will see always this quadratic behavior if we use classical light. Classical light means there is no correlation in time. And if the photons are correlated in time, we will get a linear response. So typically, the, this rate of absorption can be written something like uh, a cross-section that depends linearly on the flux of photons and another signal that depends quadratically in the, in the photon flux. To understand why one is quadratic and the other one is linear, so imagine the experiment. We have photons, we are sending a pulse, we are sending classical light. The photons that are uh, coming into the sample are not time correlated. So that means that in order to get the probability of absorbing two photons within the lifetime of the, of the intermediate transitions that are uh, contributing to the two photon absorption, we have to calculate the probability of one photon going into the sample and then multiply by the probability of getting the second photon, right? So we have the product of two probabilities that gives us the quadratic uh, form. Now, if we send photons which are correlated in time, that means that those two photons come out of the crystal, then we have the probability of getting one of the photons in the sample, but we know that they are correlated in time. So what is the probability of having another photon within the time correlation? One. So we get only one probability, and that's why it becomes linear when they are correlated in time. So that's the difference between using um, photons that are not correlated in time and photons that are uh, correlated in time. So now uh, we know that this can, can happen with the correlated photons. Ah, again, then I didn't do anything. <laughs> I don't know. It's like with football, I'm referring the time. Okay. Okay. So now um, we know that we can produce this two photon absorption, which is a nonlinear process using a very low amount of photons, which is, which is very, very good. 
this is one of the of the uh, properties that is always highlighted in this in this type of experiments and another property which is very nice um, from entangled photons is this one so you see that if we pump this nonlinear crystal using continuous let us try to change the ah okay so, in order yeah sure you will recover the time don't worry okay <laughs> <laughs> If we pump this nonlinear crystal using continuous wave, so you see, again, I, I was telling you that these photons that come out of the crystal behave as, no, as uh, short pulses. So that means that they will have this broad spectrum. So we have two wave packets that are broad in, the, in their spectrum, but when they are combined together, because they have to satisfy uh, energy conservation or momentum conservation, they have to to satisfy this condition that when they are combined together they need to be close to a continuous wave uh, signal. So what we get is that when we have these two photons together we end up having a very narrow signal in the spectrum. This is very important because if we do it classically what we expect to see is that if we have two photons that are broad in the spectrum when they are combined together classically what, what we get is an effective two photon field which is also broad. This one is not satisfying that condition. Here we have two photons that are really broad in the spectrum, but then when they are combined together, it's a very narrow line. So this is this is important if we are interested in doing some spectroscopy of doubly excited, it's called a doubly excited uh, states. So this is this is very, very relevant when we are interesting in looking at the dynamics of excitons within a complex uh, molecular complex. So these two have these two properties have inspired uh, different applications. One, one of them is called two photon virtual state spectroscopy, which is the one we are doing experimentally right now. And to understand how this, this technique works, we have to look at the, at the basics of the process. So we have two photons. Here I'm using balls, but this is not good. We, we shouldn't we, 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 we shouldn't imagine photons as little balls. So those are fields and they are everywhere. But here is just to kind of just <laughs> explain the effect. Okay, so we have these two photons. They are absorbed by the sample. And we, we look at, uh, when we look at books or papers, this is what we always read, right? We have the two, the two photon absorption. And it says that it, by, it, is, it goes through a virtual state. And this virtual state is this dashed line. But what Feynman taught us is that this dash line is actually all of these uh, processes. So what's happening is that this two photon absorption is happening through an infinite uh, sum of different, uh, of infinite levels. And those levels here are real. The sample has those levels. The thing is that the light that we are using is so far reson uh, non-resonant that we, we don't see them. But then that's why we call them virtual states. But those states are there. It's just that we don't, we cannot see them. So uh, here the question uh, was if we can access information of these of these levels, and the and the answer came from uh, the group of Baja Saleh and Malvin Tai, and they say, well, yes, you can access to those levels using entangled light and controlling the the correlations of those photons. So I will tell you how how this this works. So let's start by looking at the interaction Hamiltonian. It's the simplest one. We have dipole electric Hamiltonian. And if we calculate the probability of absorbing two photons, we get something like this. So this, is, uh, this comes from time-dependent second-order uh, perturbation theory. And this, these two terms, MD and ME, describe the matter and the field in this way. So we have, for the matter, we see that the transition from the G to the F, these doubly excited states, uh, happens through an infinite number of intermediate J states. Those transitions are characterized by these dipole moments, which is this DJ. And then there are some phases that will uh, 
act at different times. Those T1 and T2 is when the, each photon arrives to the sample, where this epsilon j is the energy of the intermediate states. Kappa j is the inverse, the inverse of the lifetime of those, of those states. EF is the energy of the final state. And E g is the energy of the ground state. For the field, what we get is, ah, sorry, uh, this, this dj, as I was telling you, this is the transition from the g to the j state and from the j to the f state. And this is basically shown here, no? The, the g to the, the g to the j is some transition that goes to one of those levels. And the next term is the transition to the f level. And you see that there is a lot of ways of going from here to here, because we have a lot of possible paths. So this is, this is important. Then to look at this term, Me, we have it here. So it's basically what it's telling us is that there is some uh, uh, evolution or some value of, the, of these operators, E1 and E2, which describe the signal and the idler photons arriving at different times at T1 and T2. And uh, to more or less imagine what are those photons, so here is the expression for the fields of each of those photons. So basically, to understand what, what this expression is telling us, here is just a constant, so forget about it. And now look at this. So here is what I was telling you. So here, in the, you see that uh, there is a wave packet with some specific shape, shape of, the, of the spectrum, which is given by this A omega 1. And the other photon is the same. So we have signal and either photons, which have different, uh, which have a, an envelope covering different frequencies, but it's one photon. So now to understand each of these elements, we look at the first one, and the first one is describing this process in which one of the photons, let's call it signal, is arriving first to the sample and then the either, and the next, the other term is the, the, other, the other case, no? where there's the, now the either is arriving for the signal, and it's because those photons are time correlated, so both uh, events can happen. So now that we have this, this information, we can now look at how this two photon state is prepared, because this is, this is the important part, how we, we produce this, this type of photons that are, are going to uh, interact with the sample. So here, again, we have the pump, we have the nonlinear crystal, these photons are produced here, I, I remember that I was telling you that there is some time delay between those photons, and there is this uh, correlation window, this time window. But now, if we're interested in introducing a delay between those photons, we have to first put them together. Otherwise, if we, they, are, they have a larger delay, then those won't be correlated anymore. So that's what we do here. We now change the polarization of the photons. Remember, one was vertical, the other one is horizontal and they were something like that after they come out of the crystal. Now we switch the polarizations, and they travel in half the crystal, and this is because we are assuming that the pump is a Gaussian pump that is focused right in the middle of the crystal. So that means that we have first, like this, the photons, they, come of the cri they, they travel through the crystal, they get a delay, then we change polarizations, and they travel half. So what we get is now the two photons are exactly in the same position. So from there, now we can introduce an external delay, which is shown here. Okay, so that's that's the, the setup that we are we are using. And of course, we have to put some equations to the state of those photons that are created, and it's something like that. So we have an idler photon, a signal photon, those are photon wave packets, and the difference with the previous uh, slide is that now the spectrum of those photons is described by this function. If this function could be written as the product of two independent functions, one for nu s and one for nu e, then those will be uncorrelated photons because they will be independent wave packets. But if this function cannot be written as a product of two functions, then that's when we say that they are correlated in frequency. What does it mean is that if they are correlated in frequency, they look something like that. And it is because if we detect a photon at certain frequency, let's say this one, the other photon will be, the, the possible frequency of the other photon is something that goes in this region. Now if we use a continuous wave, this ellipse looks more like a line, so it's really, really thin. So that means if we detect a photon at this frequency, the other photon necessarily needs to be this one. 
So that means they are correlated in frequency. However, if we uh, write this expression as the product of two functions, then we get something like this, which is uncorrelated photon. So that means that now if I detect a photon at certain frequency, then the range of possible frequencies of the other photon is really, really big. So that means that there is no correlation in frequencies. The other photon can be whatever it wants. Okay? Yes? Uh, well, for, for this one, we are assuming that it's produced exactly here, in the middle. Yeah, yeah, but yes, but in general, you should consider the whole uh, cylinder no, of the light. The source of these two photons is uh, just a point or is something? No, in general, it has to be a region where you have the focus, because we cannot focus at one point. No? We will have some width of the focus of the light. Yeah. Well, if you take it Yes, for, for the, yeah, yeah, in general, this state takes that into account. I will show how, how the expression looks like, yeah. So, uh, now that we, we have this expression for the two photon state, now we have more or less all the ingredients to, to get into to the calculation of this uh, probability for a, for a simple example. And, and in order to, to first, to understand what is the best state for this technique because we want to do it experimentally, right? So we need to know what's the best state. We look at the general expression for this two photon state here. It's all the details. So here we are assuming a pulse pump, which is more general than the continuous wave uh, case. So here we are assuming now the Gaussian beam, which, uh, which has a duration T, TP. And this function here, this is a sync function. Here we have the correlation at time that I was telling you about, and then I have this this uh, frequencies, which is the joint frequency between the two photons. This sync function is coming precisely from the geometry of the of the crystal. So the crystal is considered to be rectangular, and if we are now moving in the frequency domain, it will be the Fourier transform of that rectangular shape, and we get the sync the sync function. So now that we have this state, we look. At, the, at this probability of going from the ground state to the final state, it looks messy, but what I want you to, to look at is this, this ratio, Tp divided by Te. So this is the duration of the pump and duration or this uh, correlation time. So what is telling us this ratio is that the signal or the probability of absorbing the two photons will be enhanced if Tp is much larger than Te. To understand what that means, we need to look what is called the joint spectrum of the photons. And you see here that if Tp is four times Te, we get these anti-correlated photons. If Tp, at the specific value of Tp equal to Te over two, we get uh, uncorrelated photons. And for a very small value of Tp, we get what is called correlated photons. So from this uh, diagram, what is telling us is that the best source that we have to, that we will use is anti-correlated photons. So physically, to understand why this happens, look at this dashed line. This dashed line is showing us what is called the two-photon uh, resonance condition. That is, this line indicates the energy of the level that we want to reach with the two photons. So if this joint spectrum overlaps with this line, it's telling us how many photons of those produced in the, in the crystal will actually contribute to the two-photon absorption. So that means that if we can stretch this ellipse to, in order to make it overlap with the whole line, then we get all photons uh, being absorbed by the sample. And you see here that if we stretch this a lot, that means that Tp has to go to infinity. So that means that it's very, very large. And if Tp is very large, that means continuous wave pumping. So that is telling us that we use continuous wave then we are we are happy. So now now that we know what is the the, the source, then let's look at a very simple but uh, also interesting example, which is the transition from 1s to 2s in atomic hydrogen. This is this transition is interesting because we cannot go with a single photon because of selection rules. So it has to go. Uh, we can excite it with two photons, and the transition goes. 
and through the P states. So the idea is if we can, or the, the question is if we can define or, or, or get information about this, these levels with these two, these two photons. This is some information about the atomic hydrogen. Uh, we, we calculate this probability, we get a signal that looks like this. So you see that this is something that is oscillating, so it's a non-monotonic uh, plot or curve. And what is interesting here is that at the va different values of the delays, the sample likes to absorb, doesn't like to absorb, likes to absorb, doesn't like to absorb. So what is telling us is that by controlling the delay or this time correlation between photons, we can control how the sample behaves. So that's something interesting that it was called entanglement induced two photon transparency. So we can make the sample transparent by changing the delay between the photons. So you see that changing the properties of the light, we can change the properties of matter. So this is something that we always like to entangle photons. And the smaller shoulders this, ah, I will explain how this appeared. To, to understand why or, or the shape of this, of, this, uh, of this signal, we look at individual transitions. So if we look at the, the 3P, uh, here we are just considering that the two photon transition happens only through one intermediate state. So one of them is 3P, 4P, 5P. And we see that there is also an oscillatory signal in each case. And if we do the Fourier transform of those signals, what we will get if we Fourier transform this guy, we will get a peak exactly at the frequency of the 3P transition. If we do a Fourier transform of the 4P, we get a peak at the, for, uh, the energy of the 4P transition and so on. So basically what is telling us is that this, uh, this signal is a coherent superposition or an interference pattern of all possible transitions. So that means that all the possible pathways of the photon are interfering to produce this this signal. Okay, so that means that this signal, if we Fourier transform it, we will get information about the levels. Unfortunately, <laughs> we will get also information about these intermediate frequencies, which to us is noise because we are interested in getting information about this EJ. This will give us the electronic structure of the sample, and this is noise for us. <laughs> so the question was, well, how can we solve this problem? How can we get rid of this? This noise, the answer, or the first answer, uh, came from Saleh, and he said, well, take the signal and perform an average over the entanglement time, or the correlation time. So you but, but remember that this correlation time uh, can be changed if we change the length of the crystal. So that means in order to get this integral experimentally, we need to do a lot of measurements with a lot of nonlinear crystals, because we need to get a very nice integral. So that's a, a big problem, technically. Theoretically, no, and we can do it. Theoretically, it's fine. <laughs> we can get those peaks. We can get this, this, uh, this uh, integral, and we get these very nice peaks, and we solve all those transitions. Two peaks, three peaks, so. This means that you are in the wrong area. <laughs> the wrong area. <laughs> 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 no, but now we can do experimental. Yeah. Well, well, we will do experimental, and we'll show you how, without the need for many crystals. <laughs> Yes, so, and, and also here, I'm cheating a little bit because you see here that I started the plot at four. And that is because if we plot the remaining points, you will get more peaks. And this is why Saleh was telling that you need to know where the first peak is located. Otherwise, we, we, we cannot get information about the sample. So that's a problem. So remember, uh, that, was, that, that is a, a, big, a big problem. Another technique just, uh, a uh, very, very quick review of this manipulation of exciton distributions. So, as I told you at the beginning, if we look at the absorption of two photons, two classical uh, photons, what we get is two fast uh, pulses, which have a very large spectrum. Those two are absorbed, and then we get this effective two photon field, which is also broad in spectrum. So that means that if we are to do a spectroscopy of these levels, this light doesn't allow us to do that. Because if it's really broad, that means that those levels will have almost the same probability of being populated by that light. So that's a problem if we want to get some resolution on, this, on these levels. Yeah. But if we use now correlated photons, we know that if we use continuous wave, we will get two broad photons, 
which can really go through all these intermediate levels. But when they are combined together, we will get something that is very narrow in the spectrum. So that means that we can actually look at individual levels here using this uh, continuous field and just uh, tuning the central wavelength of our laser. So with that, we can actually do a spectroscopy of these two levels. And then the question is, well, why do you want to do that? Well, we want to do that because we can do something like this. So this is a, a proposal by, by Shol Mukamel and Frank Schlawi in 2013. And they were saying that basically think of uh, this, this uh, system, which is a bacterial reaction center. I don't know how to pronounce all this. Let's say it's a bacterial reaction center. And uh, it has 42 uh, doubly excited states and 12 intermediate states. That's the structure of, the, of that sample. So basically what we see here is that if we tune our pumping laser to the energy of this F23, that means that uh, the transition will happen through intermediate states and reach the F23. So interestingly is that this transition can only be excited through this E6 level. This, is done, this, is, this has been done experimentally. They know that this, this type of process is happening. So you see here that if those two photons are absorbed, then the first photon goes to E6. It has some time before it uh, goes to another place because there is dynamics between those levels. So if the photon arrives before something happens to this excitation, then it will go to F23. But if we wait a little bit, that means we put a delay between those photons which is larger than the lifetime of this transition, then this transition will decay to E5. So that means that if we now probe the sample at different delays, we'll get different information. So if we now put those photons in a, with a time delay which is larger than one femtoseconds, which is the lifetime of E6, then this, this excitation will go to E5. And the second photon will excite the system. But remember that we tune at F23. So now we don't have enough energy to go to F23 because it decayed to E5. So that means that the excitation will end up at a different level, which here is the F11. So that means that by changing the delay between those photons and monitoring where the excitation end up, we can get information about the dynamics of the excitons in the, com the molecular complex. So that is very, very, very uh, useful technique. There are, uh, remember this, these two big problems, and the way that we, we solve this, these two big problems is using this, this setup. Okay, so now you see that we change the many crystals for a crystal put into an oven. So now we control the temperature of the crystal. We use a crystal which is uh, called PPKTP. PP is because it's periodically pulled. So it's basically one refractive index, another refractive index, and then we put it periodically. So with the temperature, we change the refractive index of these materials, and then it changes the phase matching, and we get, what we get is this type of response for the frequency. So you see that at 50 degrees, this is experimental, by the way. So you have at 50 degrees, you have the generated photons, and then as you decrease or increase the temperature, the photons be become non-degenerate. So remember this, this X, which is very important. Now, the two photons, we, we are assuming again type two SPDC process, so the two photons come out with different polarizations, with orthogonal polarizations. We use a PBS or a polarizing beam splitter to create the two, the two uh, channels, signal and idler. We introduce a delay line here, we use a half wave plate to control the polarization of one of the photons. This is not necessary if we are using solution or something field that are not uh, controlled, that the dipoles of the molecules are not controlled. And then these two photons are sent into the, into the sample. So if we look uh, at, the, at the signal or this probability of absorption, this is theory, but we are now getting the experiment. <laughs> this, is, this is a theoretical uh, Calculation. So this is for uh, assuming two intermediate states. This is assuming four intermediate states of the sample. So you here now we have the map, which is one axis is the delay, and the other axis is the temperature of the crystal. So if we now do a Fourier transform with respect to the delay, this is what we this is what we get. So you see here that we have two different uh, types of lines. One are continuous, 
and the other lines have an X shape. So it's the X of this non-degeneracy of the photons. So somehow this non-degeneracy is inherited into the signal. What is uh, very nice is that the, where these Xs are located are exactly the energies of the intermediate states. So it's like looking at this pirate's map. No? We put an X on the levels that we are interested in. So you see here that just by looking at the Xs, we will see the structure of the sample without needing many crystals and without knowing anything about the sample. Because just looking at these lines, we know what is the electronic structure of the, of the sample. And this is uh, why or yeah, yeah, why it's, um, we say that we solve the problem. We don't need many crystals, and now we can resolve any sample. We don't need to know anything about them. So this was very nice, and if you want to know more details, look at the supplementary information of this paper, because there we really put all the details. Uh, we have been working on this type of techniques using now intense uh, sources of photons, so we are now thinking of using wave packets with more than two photons. Now we have something like 10,000 photons in each channel to improve the signal and still uh, remain at the quantum level. So we are working on, on that. And uh, yes, just to conclude, uh, I hope I convince you that entangled photon spectroscopy is expected to be a groundbreaking new way of performing optical spectroscopy that this technique will allow us to access novel information about the structure and dynamics of complex molecular systems. And also what I told you today is that we found a new simple way for experimentally implementing this, this very, very nice, nice technique. And uh, before I finish, as Oscar was mentioning that, <laughs> I am the current OSA <laughs> chair, the optical, well now they like the, to be called the Optical Society because they want to be international. It used to be the Optical Society of America, but now you will find it as the Optical Society. <coughs> and I'm leading the Quantum Computing and Communication uh, Group, technical group of the OSA. And basically, our activities are focused on this. This is what is in red, and this is for, for you guys to maximize the exchange of information and creation of networking opportunities for the community. So that's, that's probably the most important word right now in, in science is networking. So talk to people, discuss with them, really, really get, get in touch with, the, with all the researchers. And, and OSA helps a lot with that. So it, uh, it's, it's, it's more or less cheap for students. It's like $10, $10 for one year, the membership. And you have access, uh, at least from our group, and there's a lot of groups working with you in, in different disciplines. And what we do is we uh, organize webinars, technical events, workshop, tutorials, special talks, poster sessions at OSA meetings, and also these networking events. Uh, this is the executive committee. Uh, two guys are in ICFO in Spain, where I did my PhD, and two guys are in Mexico. Ricardo is in Monterrey, in CISESE, the part of CISESE in Monterrey, and Jorge Luis is in Cepata, in, in, in Querétaro. It's a center from, from UNAM. And just uh, some of the, the, the events that we organize, this was a networking launch with a lot of uh, people from the quantum uh, community. Here is Sale, who is the director of CREO in Florida. It's <coughs> Michael Reimer and all of those guys that you read the papers and so on, they are there. So you can really go and talk to them. Uh, we have organized two webinars so far with uh, Eugene Polsik and Andrew Forbes and in February we will have Ibrahim Karimi from the University of Ottawa who is quite famous uh, because of his work on OIM. So this is, this is also something to look at and also uh, my group is looking for talented and motivated people like you to join us. So if you are interested in our topics please let me know, send me an email, or just talk to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have some scholarships and that kind of thing with uh, UNAM and CONACYT. And with that, I would like to thank you. Well, we have uh, time for two questions. Oh. 
Oh my god. It's a complaint. It is very easy. Experience talking about virtual states yeah. is that there is a kind of an idea inside of a lot of people's mind that those states don't exist, don't, don't exist. But they exist, they are real levels, but the thing is that we are non resonant with those levels. I, I don't know, I, I, even, even myself uh, at the beginning, I was thinking, well, virtual state that means they don't exist. It's like they are not in the sample, let's say. Yes. photons, those levels, imagine you have this, these levels here. Ah, okay, then we use another yeah, technique. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, that's what we do. Yeah, I mean, it's just one photon spectroscopy, for instance. If you have really this tunable source, you will be able to see all those levels. The problem with this technique is that we have a single photon, which, is, which has some spectrum. And if that spectrum doesn't overlap with, with some of those levels, we won't be able to see them. We will see only the levels that are within the spectrum. Of course, if we have a, a source that has a broader spectrum, then we can see them. Yeah, so that there exists some techniques yes. that permit all the levels to see those to levels. See them. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, it will be single photon yeah. spectroscopy. Yeah. Okay. This is two photon spectroscopy. Yeah. <laughs> One more question. Question regarding the, um, um, the limits of uh, this uh, anti-correlated uh, photons. Uh, apparently, you, you showed uh, TB about four TB. Yes. Uh, well, that was an example. Yeah. That's an example. But uh, in practice, in, in practice, we use continuous wave, and well, right now we are not using the PPKTP. We are using VBO. And that gives us uh, bandwidth. Yeah, it goes. Yeah, it, it down converts photons, and with that we have a spectrum of around 150 nanometers. For PPKTP, it's uh, shorter. Yeah, but yes, right now we are using continuous wave. Yeah, so TP is really, really large compared to the. Okay. Well, uh, we have no more time for questions, so let, let's take a question, Professor Leon Murdiel. 